actually without wisdom you cannot cultivate it. But it's a, like a chicken and egg story. Right? Before you cultivate, you don't have wisdom. So how do you start? You have to start from somewhere. That's why in the teaching, there are three stages of the mud. Yeah. So these three phases or three stages of the mud, the Buddha explained it very clearly. Yeah. He said, initially when you start, yeah, you need to develop what we call pariyati. Pariyati is the phase one. Dhamma, stage one, is called the learning of the Dhamma or the teaching. So Dhamma is a Pali word. Whatever that is being taught by the Buddha is called the Dhamma. That's why the Dhamma is his teaching. But Dhamma can also mean truth because what he taught are the truth. And he summarized all his essential teaching into the Four Noble Truths. Because these are truths that are not ordinary truths. These are truths that can make you noble ones. That's why it's called Noble Truth. Noble ones during the time of the Buddha is called enlightened beings. Because these beings that are enlightened, they are very noble in all aspects of life. That's why they are called noble ones. They are very noble in their understanding of life. They understand life very clearly. They, they have developed the wisdom. Then they also conduct themselves in a very noble way. The way they speak, the way they act, the way they interact, and the way they give rise to their thought process. Uh, so the way they conduct themselves in the midst of life and society, they are very noble. That's why they are called noble ones. And they have noble qualities, especially the embodiment of the noble evil power. They have right view, leading to right thought, right speech, right action, then right livelihood. Then after that, the four right efforts. Then they have right mindfulness, followed by right samadhi. And all this give rise to the noble evil power factor of uh, they call the noble evil power. Uh, this noble evil power is only one power, but it has eight power factors. So when you have the embodiment of all these eight power factors, then you can become enlightened. So wisdom is actually the first power factor. You have right view, right understanding of life and the nature's law that governs life and existence. And that constitutes prajna or wisdom power factor. When you understand clearly all of the Nietzsche's law that governs life and existence, especially the law, law of karma, the law of mind, and the law of truth, these three right views. In Pali, the Buddha called it uh, karma niyama. Karma is the karmic thing, uh, karmic law. So, Niyama is the order, the order of karma. That's why it's called karma niyama. Is you must have right understanding and right view regard to this morality law, law of moral cause and effect, or we call the coming law. And basically, the Buddha has summarized this law. You reap what you sow. Do good because good, do evil because evil. Whatever you plant, if you plant the seed of evil, you will reap the fruit of evil. 
So all these are very clearly defined. Then the other thing that he specifically defined very clearly is the fifth daily contemplation. He said, all living beings, we are all born of our karma, heir to our karma, conditioned and supported by our karma. And we are what we are because of our karma. So this is a very fundamental understanding, right view. If we know that we are born of karma, air to our karma conditions, but we are what we are because of karma, means our whole of our life or existence depends 100% on karma. So if you don't take care of karma, you will suffer, you will become miserable, you will be afflicted. Why? Because we are born of it. We inherit everything. That's why we are heir to our come. Then every moment, we are supported and conditioned by our karma. And we are what we are because of karma. So this one will give you the right understanding to approach life. If our life depends entirely on karma, we are born of it and to it, conditions supported by it, and we are what we are because of it. So we have to take care of karma. If we take care of karma, karma will take care of our life. Because when we are born with a good karma, we will have good life. Yeah. Then we will inherit all of the wholesome merits, blessings, wisdom, and understanding. That's why we reap what we saw. When you develop goodness, wholesomeness, you will reap the fruit of goodness and wholesomeness. So you plant the seed of wholesomeness, you will reap the fruit of wholesomeness. If you plant the seed of evil, you will reap the friction of your evil action, speech and thought process. There's your evil coming. So all this will make the individual or the cultivator very, very careful, become very like determined not to fall into this wrong view. When you do not take karma seriously, when you do not understand the power of karma, then you neglect this law means you choose to be heedless. You don't want to train your mind. You don't want to develop mindfulness leading to heedfulness to take care of karma, to avoid all evil, to develop goodness, wholesomeness, merge, blessings. Then you reap what you sow. Means you sow all the heedless thinking, the heedless way of living then you will get yourself entangled. So this part is very important. And when you understand this, you move. That's why starting with this, you already have right view. So this is the beginning of wisdom. Then you start to understand why the Buddha's advice is such. It comes from this right view, law of karma, the Buddha, all Samasa Buddha, when they arrive, they give the same advice. Dhammapada verse 183. Sabapapasa akaranan kusalesa upasan padan sachitta pariyata panan etang buddhana sasana. So there are three advices within this Dhammapada verse 183. The Buddha say, you have to avoid all evil. Sabi is all. Pavasa is evil, Akaranam. Why? Because you don't avoid all evil, you will break your karmic natures. Uh, your karmic nature will be affected. You will violate the nature's law of karma and leading to negativity of karmic uh, consequence. So the first Right view to avoid evil is very important. And what constitutes evil? The five precepts, you don't take care of them. 
you don't undertake the training rule to abstain from committing these five things, then they are the root of all evil. It will cause your karmic negativity. It will condition your life to become miserable. So avoiding all evil is the first advice. So to avoid all evil, the Buddha said, you have to keep the precepts. That's why the five precepts are very fundamental to cultivation. So beginning with this understanding is the beginning of prajna. Then you cultivate this five precepts. Then you contemplate, you reflect. Then you look at your life. You observe. By holding on to the precept, it's a meritorious action. It prevents you from committing evil. It prevents you from having the causes and conditions to get into trouble. Your karmic friction of all the negative action, speech, and thought process will become much less. You're from now onward, when you keep your precept, you do not create anymore. But whatever is from your past, you cannot stop. That is the reality. So you understand this, you try. Then you put to test. In fact, every cultivator, if they are sincere, serious, once you start to cultivate these precepts, commit yourself, undertake the training rule to abstain from evil by observing the precept, your life will change. You will become a better person. You will have more and more positive wipes or energy. You will radiate a type of aura that is very different. It's the power of precepts. Precept is a meritorious action. It's a great merge. A being who holds precept can be born as a divas after you pass away. Yeah. Then because you hold your precept, you are very virtuous. You will not do wrong thing. So this First, variety is very important. Learning the teaching to cultivate, to move. So the first right view is law of karma. So that one, you develop the training to abstain from committing all those things. And to be skillful in it, to be good at it, you must also train your mind to be mindful, to be aware, to have the spiritual faculty so that you are no longer heedless, so that you can be in the meditative state throughout the day, yeah. during your waking moments. Then later on, can you go even into your sleep when you are skillful? Then after that, you will have this ability to be aware of your mental intention behind all your actions, speech, and thought process. Then you can develop the four right effort to be aware of the wrong thought, wrong speech, and wrong action as a reason. Then develop the meditative five ways to overcome unwholesome thought, to abandon them. Then after that, with the wisdom developed, after you have straightened your view, you have the Yoniso Manasakara, then you can prevent it from arising. Means the right effort to prevent the arising of the wrong thought, wrong speech, and wrong action can be developed. Then after that, the third right effort is right effort to cultivate the virtue, the wholesome action, speech, and thought process that are still not in you. Means the right view leading to right thought, right speech, right action, and right livelihood. Following the cultivation of the third and fourth right effort. So this third right effort is very important. It's the beginning of training the mind to be virtuous, to have right thought, right speech, and right action, to develop wholesomeness of thought process, leading to gentle, pleasant, and wise speeches that leads to harmony, leads to love, compassion, kindness, gentleness, respect, gratitude, generosity, awesomeness. So all this will happen.
Then after that, the way you act, the way you live your life, is all according to the Dhamma way. So you will have right action. You act in a very righteous way. You act in a very wise way. Uh, then to do that, you have to be truthful. You have to be sincere. You have to be respectful. You have to be gentle, pleasant, kind, compassionate, loving. All these are the virtues that will surface. <clears throat> so once you are able to do that, your life will transform. Yeah, this third right effort is very, very powerful. It can transform the individual. Then after that, the fourth right effort is the refinement. The right effort to refine upon and make perfect all the right thought, right speech, right action that you have developed. Yeah. That is the whole of the cultivation, including the cultivation of the noble effort, perfect right view, leading to right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, and the four right efforts. So this is a very complete pariyatic understanding. Then from there, you move on to the second stage of cultivation, which the Buddha called Pati Pati. Pati Pati is after pariyati, after you have learned the teaching, after you have understood the teaching, then you put it into practice. You cultivate it. So that phase is most important. It's like anything you do in life. Even if you want to be skillful in cooking things or making things like cake or food or whatever or anything in life. If you want to make cake, of course you can buy the cookbook or the cakebook and all those things. But if you only read the theory and you doesn't try it out, it doesn't make you an expert. In it. You don't know where you stand. And you have a lot of things to learn because you are not experienced enough. You don't have the exposure. <clears throat> so you have to learn from people who has gone through. Then they will recommend you, oh, you go and read this book, you get hold of this book. Uh, then you have to start by trying this, this, this. Then you find out that everything you try, every time you try, you learn. So when it comes to cultivation, it's the same. Knowing the Dhamma, knowledge, the theory, and not able to put it into practice is of no use. It's like the incense that has no fragrance. It doesn't has the potency. So party party, the phase two is to put this teaching into practice. So where you have to check from where the Buddha teach all this cultivation. That's why under the Dhammapada verses 423, there are 40 verses. I think verse 21 to verse 40. Oh, sorry, 20 verses. Yeah. Yeah. They are called Apamada Vaga, the verse on mindfulness. Yeah. Mindfulness. So if you were to go through this, you will know how to cultivate. The Buddha start by telling the monks, Dhammapada verse 21. He said, Heedfulness is the path to the deathless. The heedful never die. Whereas if you don't train your mind, heedlessness is the path to the dead. The heedless are as if dead. Then under Dhammapada verse 22 that follow, he said, the wise one who understand this will intend on heedfulness. And because they intend on heedfulness, they will get to rejoice in the rhyme of the Arya, so the enlightened ones. Which means 
they are destined for enlightenment. Then Dhammapada verse 23 confirm all this. Yeah. The Buddha said, the ever mindful, the constantly meditative, and steadfast one, they will realize the supreme enlightenment, Nibbana. Means, if you are constantly meditative, ever mindful and constantly meditative, you will realize the supreme enlightenment of Nibbana. Is guaranteed. So this is what heedfulness is all about. You can train your mind to be ever mindful. Then use it to meditate, constantly meditate. That's why all cultivation start with this, mindfulness, leading to heedfulness. So to be ever mindful, you have to train your mind to be mindful first. That's why we develop awareness-based meditation. Then after you have stabilized it, you use it to cultivate the meditation as taught by the Buddha, which is basically the cultivation of the Noble Eightfold Power. When this Noble Eightfold Power is being clearly expound under the fourth Noble Truth, the Buddha said, there is this Noble Eightfold Power under the fourth Noble Truth. You cultivate this Noble Eightfold Power it will lead to the end of all suffering. So you meditate for what? To become enlightened. You know? To be free from all suffering. You know? That's why you cultivate this noble way for power, which is a meditation as taught by the Buddha. It will lead to the end of all suffering. Because meditation is not about sitting and closing your eyes or focusing, concentrating, developing psychic energy and all those things, or create fantasy or beautiful mind state, develop the blissful, calm, and very peaceful, uh, fantastic mind state. That itself is not meditation. Maybe the byproduct of meditation can give you some of this. But a lot of this lead you astray. So the real meditation is you have to train your mind to be aware, stabilize it, then use it to cultivate noble eightfold power. That is the real one. So all these are very important understanding. Then after the phase two Dhamma, Patipati, the third phase is called Pativeda. The Buddha said that the face of Dhamma, you get to reap the fruit of your hard work, your diligence. When you have faith, when you have Sada, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, and Panya, the five spiritual faculty that drives you to cultivate until they become balanced, very stable, unshakable, then you will become enlightened. Once you become enlightened, you get to live the life of an enlightened being. That's why the third phase of Dhamma is the most beautiful part of your life. You can develop that. My nature rejoins and sadhu. So this is what you need to know.